Our next presenter is a longtime, uh, longtime con layer, uh, uh, Mr. Jan van, pardon me, Jan van Steenbergen. There we go. <laughs> um, and uh, many people will probably know him as the creator of numerous languages, such as, and I'm not going to pronounce this right, Venedig. Venedig. And, uh, and of course, in the Ubet. And I never pronounce this right either. Ilbetsia? Ilbetisat. Ilbetisat. Please, that's how I am. I guess everybody has to tell the story. And before I mispronounce anything else, here he is. <laughs> well, you, some of you know me, others don't, I suppose. In any case, well, five years ago, and five years and one week ago exactly, I started working on a constructed Slavic language called Slovyansky. I wasn't actually not really the person who started it, it's rather that I joined it. It was something that was about to start at the time. Well, one week before that, if anybody would have told me that I would be talking about, I would be addressing a Conlanger conference as an Auxlanger, and not as an art language, I wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> and well, at this moment I'm in the strange position that I'm both. And actually I feel quite, quite uh, comfortable being both. And it's not so simple. Anyway, then that's what I'm going to explain here. Well, actually the first slide should be I think a big uh, map of the whole Slavic world, because of course no, none of you has ever heard of the Slavic languages. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to start with something which is not really related to the topic at all. No. How does this work? <laughs> ah. I think you are all kind of familiar with this thing now. Mm -hmm. Claudio Gnoli is an Italian conlanger who invented this triangle <laughs> as a way of categorizing constructed languages. At some point there were so many of them that just constructed language was not, not enough anymore. So there are several ways of subdividing them. One well-known uh, way of doing that is uh, dividing them into a priori languages and a posteriori. I hope I pronounced that well. <laughs> well, that's a way, but I think this one's much more useful because it's a subdivision according to purpose. What, well, what has a language been made for? And so he distinguishes three categories international auxiliary languages, which are languages made with the purpose of being used by people as a second language for international communication. The second category are artistic languages, languages created for fun or for, well, for any aesthetic uh, reasons. Uh, and the third category are engineered languages. I never know if it should be an I or an E, by the way. I think both are okay now. No, no, yeah, yeah. Right. Like that. I prefer to call them conceptual languages, but, well, that's a matter of taste. There are a number of languages that don't fit in this scheme at all. And that's why I have my own little project of expanding it a bit. So first, I decided that there should be an extra category for languages created for other purposes, such as languages created for uh, educational purposes, or as well um, um, mythical languages, ritual languages, secret languages, stealth languages, all this kind of stuff. But there's a language made for uh, communicating with monkeys. You can't fit it in any of these categories, let's face it. So, we need a fourth category. And then I thought, actually, we might as well add a fifth one as well, namely reconstructed languages. Mm -hmm. 
if you look at, uh, well, proto-Indo-European, if it existed at all, the truth is that we don't know anything about it. It's not a test that we can only guess. And making such a guess is pure con laying, if you ask me. <coughs> well, and the sixth one, obviously. Well, here you have the whole thing. I, this title is a joke, let me warn you. I hope nobody is ever going to use it. Uh, <laughs> In any case, um, I don't have a pointer, I think. Yes, yeah, you have. On, on the bottom. On, on, on the round, where, where that brain thing is. On the round, yeah. Okay, on, on the round. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, box lands. Conceptual languages. It's in Dutch, but that doesn't really matter. I didn't feel like doing the whole thing over again. Uh, artistic languages. Uh, constructed languages for special use, reconstructed languages, and the last one, our lead form project for natural languages. Of course, uh, the spelling orthography for English is not a con line, but it doesn't make English a con line, I mean, but it is also a kind of con line. I think every kind of language creation that happens behind the desk is con line. So, and now Slovyansky. Slovyansky is an Oxlang in the first place, but in fact you can count it to uh, all six categories, and that's quite a funny thing. Of course, it's an Oxlang because it is supposed to be used for inter-slave communication. Uh, it's not necessarily meant to be learned as a second language by everybody. At least I don't expect it, and uh, it's not a purpose of any kind. But it could be used for that, and so that makes it an offline. Conceptual languages. Well, conceptual languages can be experimental, they can be logical. And one of the things that I've learned about Angelands is that they, by definition, can be evaluated according to their own design principles. That's a lesson taught to me by Hans Rostam. <laughs> and that goes for Slovyansky very well. It has very strict design principles, and in fact, they are so strict that a computer could create an English. <coughs> so it does belong to B in a way. <coughs> artistic languages. Well, if you consider that subcategory of artistic languages are alternative languages, like, well, also my own genetic, then you can also say that Slovyansky is a hypothetical language. The language that would have existed if the Slavic languages wouldn't have diverged into a big family of languages. What if is the key word for alternative languages, always. Well, special uses. That's a very important one, because one purpose of Slovyansky is an educational function. It can serve... <coughs> <coughs> it can help people in uh, learning and understanding Slavic languages as a, as a whole. If you know these languages, you can understand practically every Slavic language, uh, language to a degree. Reconstructed language as well, that's obvious. This language is already there. The language that is exactly at the very center of the Slavic world. We only have to discover it, to reconstruct it in a way. Well, and also, last category, the reform project for natural languages, dialects, etc. You can look at it as it as uh, a way of codifying a number of related dialects, creating a standard language for, well, for a number of well, dialects. If Rumans Grisu is uh, a code language, then Slovyansky is one of the same kinds, you can say. Okay, that's uh, <coughs> all I wanted to say about that. Now let's move to the language itself. Not only Slovyansky, by the way, but the whole project. Quite 
This is what I just explained. So, no one. You know these two guys? Well, according to some, they were coal miners. I'm not sure about that myself, to tell you the truth, but they are the ones who created an alphabet for the Slavs and, well, codified their language in a way. Some people believe that they just wrote down their own dialect, which was near Thessaloniki in Greece, in southern Macedonia. Uh, this language is called Old Church Slavonic. Um, well, yeah, that's the whole thing. Bulgarians call it Old Bulgarian, Macedonians call it Old Macedonian. <laughs> Many Slavic people call it Old Slavic, or Old Slavonic, if you like. Well, here in the West, it's generally known as Old Church Slavonic, which is not the same as Church Slavonic, I should add, but that's not important here. Anyway, uh, according to some, this language is just their own dialect, perhaps with some, well, decoration from, uh, from outside. Others believe that it is a kind of inter-slavic language already because it does have a few features that also belong to other parts of the slavic world, notably Moravia, I think. So, I like this one because it looks uh, looked like a comic. <laughs> and this is what they were doing. They brought their alphabet to the Slavs. Well, if it is a constructed language or not, well, it doesn't really matter, I think. But it looks nice. In any case, uh, a lot of people have argued that Old Church Slavonic would be an excellent choice for a slave interlanguage because it was already a slave interlanguage. I personally do not entirely agree with that, but it's true that it has been a great inspiration for Gronlangers also later. Here's an example of a language created by a certain Mr. Vyacheslav Bambas, a Czech who wrote this book in 1863, of a language completely based on Church Slavonic. Orthography is kind of fun, you see. Oh, sorry. Have we got that now? Oops. The other arrow in the other direction? Or is it supposed to be left below the table? Yeah. Well, there are some funny, funny characters, but basically it is your microphone uh, sort of. No, you are just not putting it in front of you. Use, use this, you have to do this. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, in any case, this language is essentially Church Slavonic in a slightly modified way. This project is not the only one of the type. The next one is called Novoslovensky. Um, this is a book that was published last year by uh, another Czech named Wojciech Jarubika. And this is another example of a language that is based on Old Church Slavonic. Modernized to a certain degree, uh, simplified to a certain degree, some elements are even very simplified. Uh, modernized also by expanding it with uh, modern vocabulary that comes from uh, the other projects, Slavyansky. So, well, what I'm trying to show with these languages is that they, well, they show one approach towards slow or slavic interlinguistics. Here's another one. This is also about Cyril and methods. This is a book written only one year after the book by uh, Bombas. This is also written by Matya Maria Zilski. 
uh, Slovene, and quite a famous bronze slavist. As you can see here, this book is written in a, a language created by himself in two different orthographies, Latin and Cyrillic. And this language follows a different approach. It doesn't copy anything from any old language, but he compares languages, as you can see here. This is not from the same book. This is from another book. He wrote a whole series of books. But this is what he does. He takes a word from Church Slavonic, which represented also Bulgarian and Macedonian here. The second row. Uh, yes. This this was Church Slavonic. This is Russian. This is Serbian. This is Czech. And this is Polish. He didn't do Slovak or his own language, Slovene, Croat, but that doesn't really matter. He takes the big languages, the important languages, and usually the small, smaller languages, follow them somehow in there. One way or the other. So he uses quite a, a scientific approach, and that's exactly the same, the kind of approach that has also been used in Slovyansky writing. Now, all in all, there have been a lot of constructed Slavic auxiliary languages. There are a lot more. Artistic languages, I didn't mention them here because, well, it's not really on topic. This is uh, from my own website. You can see the whole list here also with uh, text uh, samples and some more information if I've, as far as I've been able to find the links as well. Well, what you can see here is actually that it's this, this shows that it's an old idea. It's an old idea. The first projects are from the 15th century. Uh, sorry, from the 16th century, if you don't count church of on it, of course. And from that moment onwards, there have always been projects like this. So this list, well, proves, I think, two things. First of all, that no idea ever managed to catch on but also that the idea never died, and that there are always people out to justice for it. Now, if you look at this, you can see a lot of names like Panslau. That's the most common name for these languages. They all, well, most of them are named Panslavic, all Slavic, Czeslovyansky, or common Slavic. Mutual slavery, if you like. Or interslavic. As you can see, that came a bit later. Or new slavery. But in most cases, just slavery. Using the name slavic already suggests, in a way, that. That there is a slavic language, and that all the existing slavic languages are, in fact, part of it. Not necessarily as dialects, you can also treat it as a kind of dashbar. But in any case, I think the list itself is not very informative. Here I mentioned all the names of authors, and, and the year, well, here. Uh, Oh, well, never mind. This is an important question, I think. Can you treat these languages as languages, or are they, in fact, all the same language? Or rather, maybe efforts at creating the same language? Well, if you look at the authors of all these projects, you can see that the early ones are without exception, practically. People from uh, Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, 
uh, well, later Czech Republic, or Slovakia. That's no coincidence, because those were countries that for a long time have been ruled by non slave nations, the Slovaks by the Hungarians, the Czechs by Austria, Slovenia as well, Serbia by the Turks, and so on. So it's not surprising that when these nations started to, well, discover their own national identity to awaken as nations, they started looking for support outside. And what is more logical than choosing a related nation? And so it's not surprising that in those countries, pan slavism has strong, uh, traditionally been strongest. Poland is a different case. Poland usually was a superpower, and after that it was occupied mostly by Russia. So they were not interested in pan-slavism at all. Pan-slavism means foreign oppression by the Russians. Uh, the Russians themselves liked the idea of pan-slavism, but not necessarily the idea of pan-slavic language. They usually reasoned that Russian is good enough. So let them all learn Russian. And well, they do have a point because Russian is by far the biggest slave language. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> well, let's have a look. What are the differences? There is a clear difference sometimes in purpose. Some language is recreated with the hope of becoming the language of the new Slavic Empire. Some other languages have the purpose of, well, serving as a communication tool and nothing more. And other languages, again, were created just for fun. There is also a difference in size. For example, this language by Mayar Zilski, called Uzayani Pavopislovyansky. It has a really thick grammar and a very well written, scientifically written grammar, but it has no dictionary. Uh, but he did write several books in it and published, he also published a journal. Other languages, well, they vary from, from sketches and really nothing but sketches, well, with uh, a few words or a few hundred perhaps. There are also languages with uh, complete grammars, big dictionaries. There are differences in usage. Some languages, like my project, like I mentioned, has been used for publishing books. Other languages have been used for anything. And now, well, some of them are used uh, for the internet, on the internet, which gives uh, lot of new possibility. Those differences are not really of a linguistic nature. They don't really matter. But this one matters a lot more. The source of the vocabulary. Like I said, you can get your vocabulary in several places. One option is Russian. Which is not such a bad idea because Russian is spoken, it's, it is a native language of 45% of all Slavs. Another 20% speak it fluently, well, like Ukrainians and Belarusians. And of the remaining 35%, there are quite a few people who know it as well, and even if they don't know it, they can understand it. But Russian has also disadvantages, especially the fact that it's, well, it's not an easy language to learn and to handle. And most of all, a lot of slavic people who are not Russians themselves, themselves associated with foreign oppression, communism, imperialism, dangerous, beer, <laughs> you mentioned it. Well, there are, there are projects that are based on Russian, but you can't really consider them artificial anyway, so they are not 
really uh, on topic here. What is not on this thing I see now, our language is based on other slavic languages. It may sound strange, but a good candidate for that is Lemko Rusin. It's a very small minority language, but they claim themselves that their dialect can be understood by all Slavs because it is so very much in the middle. I doubt it myself a bit because it's too similar to Ukrainian for that. But it's, it's a possibility and it has been suggested. But if we go to the real constructed languages, then we have to look a bit farther. So, one option is reconstruct proto slavery. There are languages like that. Uh, one of such projects was Slovol. And it's, it works quite well, I have to say. Of course, it needs to be modernized anyway and adapted. And well, the same goes also for Church Slavonic, what I already discussed. But most in interesting, I think, are these two. Based on all living or living and dead, what if you like, Slavic languages, like uh, Maya Zinski's project and Slobiansky and many others. But and there are a few languages based on a subset. And that's not necessarily a subset of the bigger languages, but here I think rather about languages especially made for West Slavs, or languages especially made for the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire. There are not many of them, but I mentioned them for completeness. Slavyansky tries to be based on all Slavic languages and fails to do so because there are too many of them. So we will make eliminate a few groups, especially languages spoken by less than a million people. And that's also for practical reasons because it's difficult to get dictionaries and the like. So what we try to do is treat the three big groups equally. We can discuss about uh, how far these groups are valid, by the way. In any case, it's always worth subdividing them into six groups. Seven, if you include Sorbian, but we don't, because Sorbian is too impractical to work with, which is a pity, because I like them very much both. And so, what we do is apply a voting system for choosing a word. So, we don't want any language to be more important, to be, to, to, to be more heavyweight than others, but we also don't want certain groups to be more heavyweight than others, and that's why we apply such a system. So we have a Russian group, a Ukrainian Belarusian group, a Polish group, which would also include Kashubian and Silesian. Czechoslovak group, a group for Slovene and Serbo-Croatian, BCMS means Bosnian, Croatian, Montenegrin, and Serbian. That's a bit of a uh, politically correct term. And the last one, Bulgarian and Macedonian. So, well, picking a word, you just inventorize what these groups as groups do. You count the votes. And then you are not there, of course, but you have a starting point. Basically, if a word is supported by at least three groups, preferably more, of course, then it's, it's okay and we can have it. One thing to be added here, by the way, is that, well, it's not really the end of the story because we also try to achieve uh, etymological correctness. Uh, sound changes are specific for each of these groups. Well, if a certain word is absent in, in one or two groups, you cannot just look at the form of the remaining group because you also have to take into account what it would have looked like if it had existed in those two remaining groups. So there's also a whole system of sound changes from proto-slavery. 
even though proto-slavic itself is not directly taken. This is a list of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in a number of constructed slavic languages. And what you can see is that they are almost identical in most cases. There are a few exceptions, and those are schematic languages, languages which are more international than uh, slave. For the rest, it's mostly a matter of representation, but the forms are, well, practically identical. And that goes not only for the numbers, but also for the entire, for all the rest of the vocabulary. In practice, it doesn't really matter much where you get it, because the results are often not exactly identical, but very similar. So similar that you can, without any problem, use the vocabulary of, uh, of one language in, with the grammar of another language and nobody will even notice the difference. Even the creator sometimes. <coughs> More importantly, there are differences in grammar. And that's actually what it's really about. Well, you can say that from the 60 five or so projects on that list, well, 60 are, 55, 60, are naturalistic, which means that they use a grammar that is very similar to that of the natural slave language, uh, languages. They are not necessarily identical to each other, but they follow the same idea. And usually that idea is, well, eliminating the specific characteristics of, of subgroups and just working with what we have left. And that's actually quite a lot because the grammars of the slave languages are very similar to each other as well. I mean, most languages have two different uh, forms for the masculine uh, singular genitive, for example, but all of them have the, the ending A, uh, ah, I should say. And so we use that and everybody can understand it. Simple. Uh, but what is true is that all those languages have cases. They have gender. They have uh, adjectives that match in number, uh, gender, and case with the noun they modify. Do they all have aspects? Well, that's a good question. Um, usually, yes, it does, because, well, to be very honest, slavic without aspects, it's no slavic anymore. <laughs> but aspect is a complicated thing, and it's, it's one of the biggest challenges uh, when dealing with uh, this. My solution is just accept the situation as it is and just have those duplicate uh, verbs. But, well, there are, you can also say, two orientations within uh, the natural, uh, naturalistic languages. Uh, one is a more inclusive one and the other one is more exclusive. I mean by that, that a more exclusive language tries to limit itself to what is needed. For example, and that is, I think you can count, uh, this is where Slovyansky would belong. It limits itself to what is needed. So we need cases because cases are almost everywhere in Slavic, except in Bulgarian and Macedonian. So we need cases, but do we need several multiple past tenses? Well, Polish, Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, they all get by very well with only one simple past tense, which is the perfect tense in uh, sub for example, in Bulgarian. But so what? It works, and everybody understands it. Um, you can also choose a more inclusive approach, which also has its uh, advantages. You can say, let's have them all. Uh, imperfect, perfect, our wrist, why not? Um, from an educational point of view, that makes a lot of sense, actually, because when you read slated text, well, you can encounter it. So it's good if you are prepared for it. Um, 
Well, that's so much about naturalistic grammars right now. There are a few languages that have tried schematicism. The earliest example of that is Neposlava from 1913, if I remember correctly. A language which, well, mixes Esperanto and Slovio. Uh, Slovio, no, Esperanto and Slavic. The second one is Slovio. Uh, also a language with a Slavic vocabulary, but a grammar which is mostly, well, based on or at least similar to Esperanto. And there are a few more projects which are directly or indirectly based on Slovio or inspired by it. Uh, the third category are languages with, uh, with pigeonesque grammars. They appeared very late. I have never seen anything like that before uh, on the internet. <coughs> Sorry, I'm not very really helpful. Those, um, well, interslavic pigeons have existed for a long time already in, in uh, regions like the Voivodina. It was traditionally a place where uh, representatives of several slavic nations lived and met. And they had their own ways of uh, communicating with, with each other, which was a lot of uh, hands and feet, a lot of improvisation. A lot of uh, talking uh, like, uh, me want milk, me beer, beer, nice, like that. <laughs> uh, well, you can also build language on, uh, on such a principle. Why not? It has its advantages because uh, such a language does not really have a grammar. All you need is a few very simple tools for making plural. Well, I don't even think you really need the past tense, but okay, for just in case, let's have a simple one. That's not schematicism, because schematicism does imply a complete grammar. Usually a very simplified one, but, but a complete one. Well, pigeonism implies improv improvisation, short sentences, uh, simple words as well. Uh, not suitable, I think, as a literary language or a language of any kind, but very useful for tourists, for example. So just learn a few words and learn how to use them in a way that you can make yourself understood. Such a thing, well, it can come in handy. More differences. Phonology and orthography. Here you have the same thing, inclusive versus exclusive. Uh, the northern languages, especially Russian and Polish, have rather rich phonologies with a lot of uh, distinctions between hard and soft consonants, uh, with the distinction of E uh, versus A, etc. South Slavic languages, on the other hand, they have a rather simplified phonology with only E with a limited number of soft consonants. Well, and here also you can make a choice. If you go for the inclusive solution, then you have a language that is harder to use, but easier to understand for those who are used to rich phonology. Well, a, a well-known example is the word pitch versus pitch. One in Polish means to be, the other one means to hitch. Uh, if you make the distinction, it's clear, and the South Slav will understand anyway that bitch, pity, written with the Greek, is the same thing as their pity with the E. Um, here you really can't say that one solution is better than the other, it's just that they serve a different purpose. Most languages tend to be phonologically simpler, but not all of them. Well, and the last one that's quite an obvious one, some languages uses, use uh, Latin orthography, some use Cyrillic, and some use both. Well, some languages also use Greek or something. 
feel like that's more of a fun one. Right now, there are three active projects. <coughs> one is Slovensky. I already mentioned it. That's a project in which I uh, cooperate with others. The other one was is called Slovyoski, later renamed into Slavic. It started two years ago, more or less, as a, an effort towards making Slovio more natural. That, uh, well, didn't really work, and gradually it became closer and closer to Slovyansky, which is also because there's one person who worked in both teams, until, uh, well, the difference has uh, varied by itself. And the third one is Novo Slovensky, also already mentioned by Wojciech Narunka, based on old church Slavonic. An excellent project. Now, who in the world needs three projects which are all naturalistic? Is this an option? It's, of course, it's not about flags because that's only for fun. But, you know. So, is it possible for these languages to cooperate to such a degree that they can really work as one language? And I think, yes, they can. And the only thing that is really needed for that is flexibility. Um, you can say that all languages have already changed a lot through the, the recent uh, years. Slovyansky is absolutely not even similar to what it was uh, even two years ago. I have been working very hard, and not only me, but well, the whole team, which is about 20, 30 people, uh, into solving a few problems and also make it more open for, well, let's say, even for merging with other projects, including older ones. Uh, on the other hand, you cannot have one language with one grammar, uh, one orthography, one everything. I think one of the problems of auxiliary languages in general is that they're too influenced by, by real uh, natural languages, by the whole, well, almost cliche, I would say, of uh, grammar full of prescri uh, prescriptions and rules. Well, basically, we don't have any native speakers, so we're not really bound to any rules. So, well, we can make the rules, but only as far as we need them. But you have to answer a few questions. First of all, who is using the language? It's obvious that a tourist from the West who plans on visiting several Slavic countries, it's not useful to, to have to learn about cases and about, well, dual or whatever. So what do you have to offer him? Well, something which is very easy to, to remember, only a few rules, and for the rest, let him improvise a bit. Because everybody can use that. Basic vocabulary. On the other hand, oh yes, and of course, you shouldn't really make too much trouble about uh, soft, hard distinctions in consonants. I think if a person manages to make himself somehow understandable, that's good. That's really good. Then you don't have to be too demanding. But if you have a slavic person speaking to another Slav, it's a different story because he knows all the rules already. And those rules are in the case of, well, practically all slavic languages virtually the same. It's incredible how similar they are. Um, it depends a lot if a person is uh, speaking or writing. Speaking uh, has completely different requirements than writing. Uh, in the case of writing, <laughs> you have to deal with the fact that uh, if you are working on a Western keyboard, you cannot make certain characters. But if you can make them, 
there's no reason why you shouldn't use them. So that's why I, I have always been very much against the whole idea that we must have one orthography and that is the rule and everything else is bad. And just to be good. And that, well, that means one thing, flexibility. Well, you are doomed to that flexibility anyway because you deal with Latin and Cyrillic. Yes. <coughs> you deal with Latin and Cyrillic. So you need two orthographies anyway. Now, there are characters that exist in Russian Cyrillic that Serbs cannot write and vice versa. They don't have a common letter ye. Yeah. So you need to make either a choice or say, okay, use whatever you like. And both are okay. That's my preferred solution. Well, and, and the uh, other important question is to whom are you writing? If you are, for example, having a website for a company or something, and you want to reach the entire Slavic world, then you must use a language that is maximally understandable, that avoids archaic words, words that may not be very understandable, but it's important that you concentrate as much as possible on understandability. Then you need a more inclusive orthography, because on a website it doesn't really matter if there are characters that are hard to write. Um, but if it's a, well, a, a chat session, then it's a different story, then it's better to to write quickly and easily. And there's another thing, if you write, if you uh, speak or write to South Slavs only, then you shouldn't say grot, you should say grat. Um, if you speak to Russians or Poles, then it's the opposite thing. Uh, well, you can choose a middle solution, but it's good if you have a uh, language that offers you the, more, the possibility of making the choice for yourself, dependent on the moment. So, I think to, to put an end to this, this is what the language, in my opinion, and then I mean the interslavic language, which includes, which is basically the language people have been trying to build already for, for centuries, it should not be a language in the traditional sense. It should be, uh, well, a set of recommendations. That's what I like to call it. Which means people are free to use with it whatever they like. It can merge very easily into another language. You can turn your own language into it. That's also an idea that was already proposed by Maya Zilski. He taught you a few methods of well, making your own language first look more into slavery, then change a bit grammar, then, well, change a few words, and there you go. And then suddenly, uh, even a Bulgarian can understand the Pole. Uh, that's what I call flavorization. Flavorization. So, the possibility to merge the language to, to how do you call it? Uh, to, uh, well, to mix it either with your own language or also with the language of your audience. Because if you already know a bit of Russian, then why should you use into Slavic if you know some Russian words, if you are speaking to Russian? So it's, it's important that you have that freedom. As for grammar, well, dependent on the purpose and on the situations, you need a very simple grammar, which I call Slovianto, which is, of course, a joke. An intermediary grammar and uh, rich grammar, which is more for well, sophisticated purposes, for education, and uh, perhaps even for the church, who knows. Also a flexible orthography. A very inclusive one, which uh, conveys a lot of information. Uh, an intermediary one and a very simple one, which doesn't make any distinctions, which are not really necessary. And the dictionary, a dictionary with functionality for several uh, well wishes that people may have, but also well, if you know in advance that you are going to write something for your checks, 
that you can emi eliminate words that exist only in uh, East and South Slavic, for example. Well, this uh, sophisticated orthography, and that's what I created myself, <laughs> and that's what I call now dictionary in place of Gaudelsky, or the scientific exercise. This contains a lot of letters that do not exist in any Slavic orthography. For example, this one is a Scandinavian letter, not only. Um, you use it in cases when uh, proto slavic tort and tall sequences change into tart, talt in South Slavic and in Czech uh, Slovak, in tol a trot, to what in West Slavic and torot, tolot in East Slavic. I think this letter makes it possible for somebody to recognize that particular sequence and also makes it possible to modify the language according to his own needs. Um, well, that's about it. You can see uh, all this on my website. I think. Ah, yes, well, here's an example. This is what the text looks like in Naubuchni Mitchell Sotelsky. I wouldn't like, like that. It's good that you have the information, but it doesn't mean that you have to use it. It's, it's just that you, well, have the option of using some things and to leave away what you don't like. It's then like, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. Um, what I tried to show in that uh, example was also, this is a transcription into the most simple one without soft vowels, uh, soft consonants, sorry. This is normal Cyrillic orthography, and this is a flavorized form for North Slavic. Well, I'm not going to delve into details, but you can see that a few very frequently used words are more specifically understandable for Russians and Poles instead of Bulgarians and Serbs. Well, that's it, I think. Yes. <laughs> well. I wonder, are months, months in Slovyansky in Slavic origin or European origin, like January, February? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, there are indeed two kinds of months in Slavic. Most Slavic languages use the European months, so January, February. Some languages use Slavic names. Now, there is a problem with Slavic names, namely, they do not match each other. Uh, Listopad in Czech is it's November, right? <coughs> in Croatian, it's October. In Polish, it's November. Uh, some names are, from, well, in Belarusian, the word for October is Kastrychnik, which nobody outside Belarus would understand. So, those Slavic names are a bit of a problem. I think we should offer them well as a for for purists, and there are quite a lot of purists in this uh, little world of uh, non-Slavic languages. But I wouldn't recommend it. The Latin names are understandable for anybody. So if you really want to focus on understandability, then it's better to use the Latin names. Uh, I wanted to ask if you uh, know something um, about the project sponsored by Grundweg from European Union. Ah, yes. Does it does function? Uh, yes, I, I, I'm supposed to be there in, uh, in uh, uh, August. I don't know offhand what it is. No, I, 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 uh, I wanted to ask if you know something, because uh, um, uh, there are some candidates uh, involved in it. Uh, or, or I'm afraid I don't really know the details. I know the idea. The idea is uh, setting up uh, software testing uh, interslated languages. It's mostly focused on North Slovenians, but not only. And, uh, it's mostly for all of them. But I don't know how many years applications there are, if it's still possible to apply. Uh, I have applied, but uh, I didn't get a scholarship, unfortunately. That's not the fault of uh, 
of uh, voting for its default of uh, my own uh, city governments. Uh, as I know, it would be the first time the European Union from the Grundtvig um, uh, does um, sponsor it. Yes, and that's a great thing, I think. And there are also problems for it, because, for example, Russians cannot come there, which is a great disadvantage, I think. But the idea itself is great, and I hope it will, uh, it will take place, it will become a success. Thank you very much.